So Team USA, filled with big names like LeBron James and Steph Curry and all these guys, Team USA narrowly won a pre-Olympic exhibition game against South Sudan over the weekend. They won by one point. They won by one, a team filled with NBA players, and they won by one point. Now, the, the South Sudan team gained their independence 13 years ago. So 13 years ago, and they put together an out-of-body – this is the kind of game, if they had won the game, they would have made some kind of Disney movie about it, that the, this team of misfits ended up – beating a team of NBA Hall of Famers and legends and all that. Well, get to the point, please. So I'll give you the the, the key part. It's the, the red meat in the lion's den. So U.S. coach Steve Kerr, he took the blame. Blame me. I'm the guy. Blame me. So he took the blame. Steve Kerr says Team USA's victory, one by one point, is on him, is what he said. He said, I didn't do a great job preparing our team. We did not focus enough. And uh, what they're capable of, and that's on me. Is that how you see it? That quote from Steve Kerr. So I've got Typhoon Lagoon, Kangaroo Court, and Temp Agency. And we will combine all of these things together, and we are going to make the Maller Palooza, the big talent show. It's coming up, our variety show, a week from today. So get in early if you'd like to participate in that. Now, the first thought, though. As far as Steve Kerr's quote, this is a boilerplate response by a coach. It's a nice gesture. It's also an empty gesture. It is. Uh, Steve Kerr, if you look at the dynamic there, Steve Kerr is along for the ride. He's getting a nice vacation in France, and it's a working vacation, but he's along for the ride. He's not the steam engine. Uh, he, he's not the the locomotive. Steve Kerr in this dynamic is the caboose. He's bringing up the rear. And that rinky-dink performance is on the players. And if you want to crown them, you can crown their ass, but that that's on the players, right? They were over 40-point. USA, Team USA was over 40 points favored, and yet they visited the Typhoon Lagoon. They floated on the Lazy River of mediocrity, and there's no other way to say it. It doesn't matter coaching. It's not X's and O's. It's effort. It's purely effort, running from the grind, if you will. And the fact that this game came down to the final seconds and needed heroics for the Team USA squad to win, there's no other way to say it. It's utter madness, sheer and utter madness that it came down to that. It's ridiculous. Uh, rather than roll up your sleeves, get to work, and just blow everyone out by a gazillion points like the original Dream Team did back in the day, LeBron's team, and LeBron didn't have bad stats, but his the team in general went on a siesta, a little, a little snooze. All right, now secondly, speaking of Team USA, Joel Embiid, who plays in Philadelphia, but he's also part of the USA squad, he took some blame did a wide-ranging interview, and he took some blame for the 76ers being unable to get even to the Final Four like the Clippers got to a couple years ago. So how much of the actual blame is on Joel Embiid? I know he took the blame, but how much of the blame is actually on him? So Embiid is being the D-word diplomatic. All right, so that's the way I see it. He's being, he's being a diplomat. He's been hurt often, which is a problem. Right? It is an issue. Although in recent years, it hasn't been as big an issue. He won an MVP a couple years back. So he's he's had success, and he's been healthy, and yet they still haven't done anything. The bigger problem, and this is my diagnosis here. I went to the lab, and I made my diagnosis, is that the Sixers, their problem was the kangaroo court. They lost in kangaroo court. The Sixers tanked for years They went to the very bottom of the sewer and then dug a hole and went even deeper. All of it to work around the lottery and to win first picks overall. They they got Ben Simmons and Markel Fultz back-to-back years, the Sixers did. And you could say the Aussie muffed it. Ben Simmons, even Aussie was, and our guys listening in Australia, they they tell me, oh, this guy's embarrassing. He's embarrassing the people of Australia. He went out there. He was the number one overall pick in 2016. Right? Top of the draft. 
And he was all right for a couple of years. Never great. Couldn't shoot from the outside. And then all of a sudden he vanished. Completely went away. Like a deformity in his game. He's still getting paid. Not on the Sixers anymore. And Markel Fultz was the number one overall pick from the 2017 draft. And he's been nothing special. Last I checked, he was in Orlando, although I, I heard he's not long for there. So Joel Embiid, who does have soft spots in his game, but yet side by side, if you're being fair, he's the magnum opus compared to these other guys. And now Philly is turning to another flawed player in Paul George, by George, who has his own glitch in key moments. They never seem to learn. They never seem to learn. All right, final thought. Speaking of PG-13's old squad, they showed off over the weekend, we were away, the new palace in Inglewood, the Clippers opening up the Intuit Dome, and they had all the bells and whistles out. They've got, like, the coolest T-shirt cannon in all of North American sport, the industrial complex of sports. They've got the most urinals. Uh, if you want to urinate, that's the place to go. Uh, it's just amazing. It's like heaven for people that like to have urination. Uh, just a great arena. So they showed off their palace, and Steve Ballmer, he gave an interesting quote, which was sent to me by some Clipper honks, two of them. And so I wanted to spend a couple minutes on this. So Steve Ballmer, the richest man in North America that owns a sports team, Ballmer pointed out that he doesn't really own the Clippers, not because the NBA dopely calls them governors, no, they're owners, but Ballmer says he doesn't own the Clippers. He said somebody once told him that you never really own a basketball team, you just take care of it for the fans until the next person comes along and takes care of it for them. Like Essentially, you're, you're just the, the gatekeeper, uh, you're the, uh, the person, the custodian, if you will. Uh, says, so hopefully we have an asset that the community can value for decades to come, close quote. So Steve Ballmer, the owner of the Clippers, people's team, says you never really own a, a pro sports franchise. You just take care of it. Uh, your thoughts on that. So uh, it is a noble thought. I'll start with that. It is a noble thought to say that. It's technically not wrong, right? You're not going to own the team forever. You don't live forever. Um, but really what the, the bigger thought is this. You look at a team like the a job like this. You know, I do a radio show. Somebody at some point will replace me, and there'll be a radio show, and they'll do it. It'll be their show, and then somebody after them. And it's a life is a temp agency. That's really the point, right? Whether you own a sports team or anything in life, everything is temporary. Everything, right? The only thing permanent is that everything is temporary. That's it. Uh, and regardless, now some perspective owning a professional sports team. The closest comparison, the comp, if, you, if you're looking at like real estate for a comp, the comp would be like buying a rare painting, right? getting your hands on a, uh, on a, on a, a painting that has tremendous value, and it, you know, it's like, wow, it's amazing. It's a status symbol. It's a Picasso, right? It's, it's a status symbol. It's a toy for the, uh, the oligarch, the robber baron, and you can't take it with you. And, and while having... The team is cool. Making money hand over fist is also pretty cool. So, but it's not like you're trying to keep prices down. Like, I, to me, if you were to own a team and you wanted to make sure the community could enjoy it, you'd make sure to keep the prices down. You wouldn't gouge people at the snack bar. You wouldn't overcharge for the tickets. But it's not like anybody in professional sports is operating like Costco. We talked about this earlier. They have the dollar fifty hot dog and, and drink. And it's been a dollar fifty since they started it, and it's continued to be. It's it's a loss leader for for them, but they get people in, and people buy it, and then they buy other stuff that costs a lot of money, and they make more money. And the same with those rotisserie chickens at Costco. But people in sports don't operate that way. They're like, well, we're gonna keep the prices down. We want to make sure the community can enjoy this. That's not how they do things. No, they 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 go into your wallet at every chance they can get. 